Good morning. Uh, take your Bibles and open them up with me to the wonderful book of Leviticus. Uh, as we stated yesterday, as we began the book, Leviticus is one of those books that if you spend the time to really understand Leviticus, then everything that is talked about in the New Testament about the priesthood of believers, atonement, uh, holiness, sanctification, all of these things will come much more into focus. We'll be able to understand them much uh, more completely if we will understand the symbolic images of this that were given beforehand. So we're spending work, we're spending time, we're putting in work, let's put it that way, to understand uh, how the religious system of Israel worked. Uh, all of it is helping us uh, to understand when Jesus Christ comes on the scene and he's talking of atonement, substitution. How do we understand this in a more complete way? This is going to help us. So yesterday we went through the burnt offering. Uh, today we're going to go through what's called the meal offering or sometimes called the grain offering. Um, sometimes this offering gets a little bit confusing, but remember the two categories. There's categories of sweet aroma to God and ones that aren't uh, sweet aromas to God. One was in fellowship with God, the sweet aroma, and one is to regain fellowship with God. That's the not the sweet aroma. In this one, we're actually going to see that there are times when this can be used as a sweet aroma to God and sometimes not. So we'll uh, go through this today and try to understand it uh, in a better way. Right off the bat, let's state this. The meal offering or the grain offering is the majority of the time connected with other offerings. So, if I brought a burnt offering, I would also bring a grain offering or a meal offering with it. And they would be given at the same time. We can see evidence of that. Let's go back to Numbers, or go forward to Numbers. Numbers 28. Numbers 28. In Numbers 28, verses 4 and 5, say this. You shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. Uh, that's the burnt offering. Also, a tenth of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering mixed uh, with a fourth of a hen of beaten oil. So, we see right off the bat, um, yeah, we see right off the bat that every day, a burnt offering was given in the morning, a burnt offering was given at twilight, and along with it, a grain offering. And we're going to understand more about that. So sometimes, or the majority of the time, the, the grain offering or meal offering was connected with the burnt offering. At other times, it was connected with what we haven't studied yet, the peace offering. Let's go to Numbers 15. Numbers 15. In Numbers 15, look with me at verse 4. It says this. The one who presents his offering shall present to the Lord a grain offering of one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of oil. Um, I'm sorry. Go up to verse 3. Then make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, or a sacrifice to fulfill a special vow, or a free will offering, uh, or in your appointed times to make a soothing aroma from the Lord, from the herd or from the flock. So it, it's connected with this free will peace offering. Again, all of these offerings are in the category of communing with God. There's no nothing I need to deal with before God. I'm just spending time with him because I want to. Sometimes we're going to see in our text the meal offering or grain offering is connected with the Feast of the First Fruits. And we'll study some about that. Um, 
At other times, the, the grain offering is connected with a, if a leper comes to the priest and is presenting himself to that he's cleansed or that he's well, he'll bring a grain offering. If uh, someone is fulfilling their Nazarite vow, they would also bring this same grain offering. So we'll see it come up a lot. And it's uh, one of the the staples that actually fed uh, the priests. So if you haven't read chapter 2, well then now is a great time to pause this video and go read it. It's not very long, uh, 16 verses, and we'll try to connect this with the New Testament and show how Christ is seen in the meal offering. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your provision in our life. We thank you that you have allowed us to be stewards of your material possessions. And Father, may we keep that at the forefront of our mind today so that when we are tempted to disobey, may we understand that everything that we have and everything that we are is yours. And that in that, we want to be pleasing to you today. So Father, may you keep in the forefront of our mind that one day we're going to stand before you and we want that to be the best day ever. Father, also remind us today that everyone that we come into contact with is immortal and will live forever either with us or separated from you. So Father, may we be intentional in how we live today. May it be driven uh, from our communion with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, when we're going through these offerings, there's a lot of repetition. So if we went word by word, verse by verse, as you just did when you read it, there is a lot of things that just repeat. And in this, in this video, it would be a little awkward. So we're going to do it much the way we did the burnt offering. Uh, we're going to talk about three different categories. First, we're going to talk about the nature or the substance of the meal offering. There are different aspects to it we're going to talk about. Then we'll go from there to the restrictions and qualifications uh, in the this type of offering, and then we'll see God's acceptance of it. So as we begin in verse one, it says, now when anyone presents a grain offering, an offering to the Lord, then it's going to give certain restrictions or qualifications. We'll talk about that. Um, but there's three different aspects to this offering that is given to us straight up. First, it can be an uncooked version of the grain offering. If you're just going to bring grain in or flour in, that's fine. You can do that. Or uh, look over with me. That's what we just read in verse 1. Look over at verse 4. Now, when you bring an offering of a grain offering baked, okay? So there is other ways you could bring this grain offering. Uh, look down at verse 14. If you bring a grain offering of early ripened things to the Lord, this is connected with harvest time and the first fruits uh, feast. So it's, it's a different. Remember, we've already stated many times, the majority of times, this offering is connected daily with the burnt offering. Sometimes it goes with the free will offering or a peace offering. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But then once a year during harvest time, the feast of the first fruits, it is connected there. So that's the three aspects, the three uh, different substance of this offering. Now, you might say, well, what is the purpose of this offering? It doesn't explicitly say in the text what it is, but implicitly we can start to understand that the Lord expects his people to offer the best that they have. Um, they're offering themselves and they're offering the best that they have for two purposes, for gratitude and commitment moving forward. So we're thankful for what God has done in the past 
and in the present, and we're committing ourselves to be even more focused on Him uh, in the future. And so that is the aspect of this. Much of what we take, and I think we, we pull, when we talk about tithing, tithe means 10%. It is basically an Old Testament um, teaching. Uh, some people pull that into the New Testament. I don't, I think needlessly they do. When we're in the New Testament, we should totally be talking about stewardship. But stewardship is, it comes from the idea of the tithe or what we're talking about here. That everything that I have is the Lord's. And I want to constantly be reminding myself that I am the Lord's and everything that I have is the Lord's. And God's telling us the best way to keep reminding ourselves of who owns what is to be giving a portion, uh, a, a small portion to show that the whole belongs to the Lord. So, um, to express gratitude, commitment, I give, and uh, so that's the nature and substance of this offering. As we go from there, there are certain restrictions and qualifications for each aspect. First, um, as we look at verse 1, it says, If it's uncooked, it better be fine flour and some oil put on it and frankincense on it. So, a spice that makes it smell a certain way. And um, look over, there's some more qualifications in verse 4 for the one that is cooked. So if it's cooked, it shall be unleavened cakes of flour uh, mixed with oil. Unleavened wafers spread with oil. If your offering is a grain offering made on a griddle, uh, here's the qualifications for it. Uh, if it, verse 7, if it's made in a pan, here are the qualifications for it. No leaven. Now, if you remember back in Exodus when we were talking about consecrating, uh, during Passover, uh, they would go through their houses and they would make sure that their houses were clean and that there were... Uh, all the leaven was taken out. There was no way when they make their uh, Passover meal, that any leaven was going to get into it. Same idea with this meal offering. No leaven was to be in it. Now, why? In the Bible, leaven is yeast. Of course, we understand that. And e yeast is one of those things that just permeates everything. And sometimes uh, it is talked about in a positive way. Sometimes it is talked about in a negative way. Uh, here, it's talking about it in a negative way. Um, don't put any yeast, anything that permeates through the whole uh, dough, uh, to ferment it. So no corruption is the idea here. Um, with our uh, offerings, God doesn't want corruption. He wants no defect. And in the meal up with the burnt offering, no defect. Don't, don't bring your lame. Don't bring your hurt. Don't bring what you can't use. Bring the best. Here, uh, nothing that's going to ferment this. Nothing that's going to help this last longer. This is pure. No corruption before the Lord. Um, if you look down in verse 15, it gives some more. Um, in verse 15, it says, uh, you shall put, uh, now for the first fruits, it says you shall put oil on it, lay incense on it. It is a grain offering. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, well, let's talk about this now. Um, look at one of the qualifications in this offering that's given in verse 13. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, shall be seasoned with salt. Okay? So don't put any leaven in it, but I want you to put salt in it. Okay? So 
no leaven, salt. And salt back then was very precious. It was almost meted out like currency. That's how, um, how rare it is. And it says, so that the salt of the covenant of your God, of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, the, the biggest thing that salt does is preserve. Now, let's look at a couple texts. Let's go to Numbers 18. Numbers 18. In Numbers 18, verse 19, it says this. All of the offerings of the holy gifts, which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord. Um, wait a minute, is that right? Numbers 18, 19. Yeah, there it is. Um, all of the offerings of the holy gifts, which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It's an everlasting covenant of what? Salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. So salt is a something that preserves. And so what they would do in any covenant that was made between people or two sides, they would take a pinch of salt as a symbolic gesture of preserving the covenant that's been made here. At times, and later on, uh, people would take a sword and they would dip the sword in salt and they would lick the sword, the salt off of the sword, stating that if this covenant is broken, the sword is coming. And so here, God is instituting this in the covenant that he has made with Israel. That daily, morning and night, this salt being put in, and in every other grain offering, this reminder of the covenant. Look again at, look, let's look at 2 Chronicles 13. 2 Chronicles 13. 2 Chronicles 13 verse uh, 5 says this. Uh, do you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? So again, this idea, um, this covenant is going to last. It's going to be preserved. I think this brings really into focus when Jesus starts talking about this in Matthew 5. So let's go to Matthew 5. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in the beginning of this, he has laid out the Beatitudes. And really the Beatitudes, if you, if you ever want to know... Um, the plan of salvation listed in the Bible, uh, the Beatitudes is it. Um, it lays out very clearly what is needed uh, to be right with God and then the, the result, what will, it will look like to be uh, loving other people. So you get down to Matthew 5 verse 13 and he's gotten through. Now you know what it takes to be right with God. Now you're seeking to love other people now he says this, you are the salt of the earth. Now think about it. Salt is the preserver of a covenant. Now, now he's saying Christians are the salt. God wants all of humanity to come into a right relationship with him. And we are the ones that are out there trying to preserve this, uh, lighting the way. He also gives that example here. So he gives this, he says, if the salt has become tasteless, meaning salt tastes because of what it is. So the only reason that salt would become uh, tasteless would be because it would, was contaminated by so many other things that the, the, the salt flavor can't come through. So salt is salt by its very nature. 
Christians are Christians by their very nature. But if we are so contaminated by lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, then we're going to be a detriment to what preserving the covenant. Now, look what he says. Um, if how can salt, if it's so contaminated, how can it be made useful again? And the, the idea is that it cannot be. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We are in the world as Christians trying to show people who God is so that they might surrender their lives to him. But if our lives become so contaminated that the preserving nature of salt that is in us can't come out, we're useless. And instead of helping people to know God, we're actually giving them traction on the way to hell. And I think that the salt of the covenant in the Old Testament is pointing right uh, to that in, in the New Covenant in the New Testament. So um, we've got the nature and substance of the, this meal offering. It can be cooked. It can be not cooked. It can be done daily or it can be done on any special occasion or it can be done during the feast of the first fruits. Uh, the restrictions, it's got to be free from corruption. Uh, there are certain ways that it needs to be cooked if you want to cook it. There's certain elements that need to be put into it. But all about this, this salt, it's a reminder of faithfulness to the covenant made by God. Remember, God says, if you'll do what I command, this is the covenant at Sinai, which they never really with upheld. If you'll obey me, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And they said, everything that you have said, Lord, we will do. Did they have some victories in that? Yes, but way many more defeats. Um, so let's get to the acceptance of this. Um, in verses 2 through 3, look what it says. Uh, he shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and shall take it from it in a handful of its fine flour and of its oil, with all of its frankincense. So you, you bring in the offering and Aaron or one of his sons would take a handful. And this is called a memorial portion. And the handful was put on the altar of burnt offering and burnt up. The rest of it was the portion that Aaron and his sons would eat from. So the memorial portion would be just a portion is given as a reminder of the whole. And again, this is reminding us to motivate us in the future for, or for obedience. That it's not that the memorial portion belongs to God. The memorial portion is a realization that all of it belongs to God. And the same thing with the tithe when it's mentioned later on. In, in the New Testament, the same thing that is talked about stewardship. Stewardship is that I am going to have to give an account when I stand before God of every material thing, even my life that's temporary here on earth. What have I done with it to further God's kingdom? Have I been about eternal things or have I merely been about the temporal things that won't last? 1 Corinthians 3 lays this out in categories of building materials. Am I building with gold, silver, and precious stone? Or am I building with wood, hay, and grass? Because the ultimate test is fire. Yeah, wood, hay, and grass is not going to last in fire. Uh, gold, silver, and precious stones are refined and made better through fire. So this idea of I'm a steward. I better be examining what my master wants from me. And am I being obedient persistently day by day? Not knowing when he's going to call me in to account. Uh, so keep this in mind. As we look at this in the past, we can look forward to right now. 
Ask yourself these questions. If I were to lay out my priorities on a piece of paper, how much of the priorities of my daily life are focused on eternal things? There's not many. There's only two. The Word of God. And just the fact that you're taking time today to open up God's Word and to even watch this video is encouraging. Because without the Word of God, there's no other place to begin. But when I'm in God's Word, it should not just be knowledge that I'm getting. It should be implanted in me as I'm communing with God. And this should stir up in me. More love for God, but then love for other people. And so I'm going to be want to, wanting to branch out. So two eternal elements, the Word of God and the choice that people make about the Word of God. So I want to be sure about the choice that I have made about God's Word. But then I also want to extend the gospel to others so that they can make a clear, conscious decision about their own eternity. And so keep that in mind. Uh, God's acceptance. Look over at verse 8. Look what it says. It says, When you bring in the grain offering which is made of these things to the Lord, it shall be presented to the priest, and he shall bring it to the altar. The priest then shall take up the grain offering. It's a memorial portion. And shall offer it up in smoke on the altar as an offering by the fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. Remember, soothing aroma is an offering that is made in fellowship, communing with God. If it doesn't mention soothing aroma, it's trying to return to or get back to fellowship with God. Look at verse 10. The remainder of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons, a thing most holy of the offering to the Lord by fire. It's interesting that this offering, when it says most holy, it means it's not common. It's set apart. But yet Aaron and his sons, the priests, could eat of it. Why? Because they are too set apart. Now, this is the whole idea as Christians being what First Peter says, a kingdom of priests. Every one of us are priests mediating the gospel from our communion with God to a lost and a dying world. Verse 16 also gives God's acceptance. says, The priest shall offer up in smoke its memorial portion, part of its grits and its oil, and with the incense of an offering by fire to the Lord. So again, in sacrifice, every sacrifice is a picture of surrender. Uh, when it's an animal giving its life, it's a picture, a substitute of our commitment. We're surrendering ourselves to the Lord. And the fire burning it up is a picture of God's acceptance of it. Uh, when that picture gets out of whack, when the priests don't obey God's structure, there is stern discipline and it's meted out quickly. Um, I want to take this time as we end our time together today to look at one Old Testament text and a, a few New Testament texts that will help us understand this meal offering stuff. So first, let's go to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, right in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 40, and we're going to go to verse 6. Psalm 40 verse 6. This is a psalm of David, and look what it says. It says, uh, sacrifice and meal offerings you have not desired. Well, wait a minute. He, he did desire that, but what David is saying here, the most important thing to God is not the, the burnt offering and the meal offering. It's grouped here together because remember, the burnt offering and the meal offering were given every morning and every twilight. Uh, it says, sacrifice and meal offerings you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. 
I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. The whole point of all of this outward ritual is inward desire to please God. They're already a redeemed people. Now, from that redemption, will they love God? Will they, will they love him enough to sacrifice themselves and their desires and their dreams? And for the most part, the majority of them did not. However, David, even though he did some frightening things in his life, he was a man that, after God's own heart. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, your law is within my heart. You can see David yearning for the new covenant when this would be an inward aspect. And David had that reality. Let's read some more about it. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, the fulfillment of this. In Hebrews chapter 10, look with me at verse 5 through 9. Uh, the Bible says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. He's quoting what we just read. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and a whole birth offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law then he said behold i have come to do your will he takes away the first order to establish the second talking about jesus by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all and then it goes through Every priest stands daily ministering offerings time after time. Burnt offerings, meal offerings, morning, night. Um, it says, but Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from the time onward until his enemies will be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified. The idea of all of these millions of sacrifices throughout the centuries, all pointing to culmination and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the priest and the sacrifice made once. A um, couple other texts I want you to go to. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6. 19 it says this do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit who is in you uh, whom you have from god you are not your own you have been bought with a price therefore what glorify god in your bodies uh, it's not about the outward ritual it's about you let's look at one more uh, go with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. This is what it says. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. It's a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus and now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever amen the Philippian church was a, a poverty stricken church and yet they were giving to Paul to further his ministry they were giving out of their want and Paul is using the picture of the meal offering of this fellowship with God, this sweet aroma. And he's saying, hey, when you sacrificially give so the spread of the gospel can happen, man, it's a sweet smell to God. And you can be assured that God will supply everything that you need. According to not my 
riches, but according to his riches. Today, may God receive the glory from our lives. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for today. May your word be on our minds and on our mouths. May what comes from our mouths be not our thoughts and our own understanding, but your, your word. Today, may our lives today, Father, be an offering to you. Um, today, may we be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you, which is our <clears throat> reasonable act of worship. Father, you are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.